And uh, now let's move uh, uh, to uh, our uh, next speaker coming uh, all the way from Sweden, uh, West Coast. Jotebori, right? Jotebori, kinda? That's good, that's good. I've been training. And um, Niklas, uh, Niklas Ackerblad, but ah, uh, how do you say it? Oa. Oh, God, that's difficult. Ackerblad, yeah? Okay, thank you. And um, so Niklas is, uh, I guess, many of you, probably each one of you, know Niklas because of uh, his work uh, with um, uh, Hotline Miami 1 and 2. He did, uh, yes, now you remember, you see. And um, he did the artwork uh, for both games and also uh, some of the music. And, uh, but besides that, he has also worked on other projects such as uh, Cometen, this uh, iOS game which was released, we just realized now. It was released kind of exactly five years ago and it's still available in the uh, App Store, and it's still a great game today. And uh, all the graphics, all the visuals were done uh, in watercolor, like uh, hand-drawn, and it's a pretty special game. Still today, I think, after five years, it's a pretty unique game, so well done. And, uh, but today, uh, Niklas is going to tell us more about uh, the game uh, Else uh, Heartbreak, uh, which has been in development for a while now, but uh, is planned to be uh, they're planning to release the game uh, this year, and basically, it's gonna tell us more about uh, how they build the city for the game and uh, the importance of expanding your mind, right? So let's expand it, okay? Let's please welcome Niklas. Okay, hello. Uh, so, uh, as the talk says, I think it says something, expand your mind or you'll end up a lonely, washed out artist or something like that. I just wanted to touch upon that a little bit. There's not really much to say, but today with all computers, like we're all wor working with computers. I mean, how many in here are uh, like artists? Almost everyone. I mean, we're all artists, we work with video games, but how many are sort of like drawing by hand? Like not just using a Wacom or something like that? Uh, what I learned when working with Els Heartbreak was that it's very like good to expand, if you want to expand your artistic skills to uh, actually draw by hand in like a notebook or something like that, because then you need to be present. It's almost like a musician playing a guitar. Uh, you have to perform in, in the moment. Uh, when you work with a computer, you're always sort of like the, the immortal uh, swordsman because you don't have to work on your technique. You can, always, like, you can always win. Even if you lose an arm or if you lose a leg, you can still fight, but your technique is going to get sloppy. So if you really want to expand your technique, it's, I think it's pretty important. To, uh, to train these skills in the present, like drawing in a notebook or something like that. Because if you fuck up, you, you fuck up. You can't just press Control Z or something like that or erase it. So that's pretty important. Uh, and also, there's a quote. I forgot who said it because I was born in the 80s. So I sometimes forget that Google exists. Uh, but the quote goes like, Amateurs loan and professionals steal. And at first I thought this was sort of weird because the, the quote didn't really make sense to me. But I thought a little bit about it and came up. What, what I think it means is that if you loan something, you're sort of like just taking it like this and putting it here inside your work or whatever. But if you steal something, you take it to your heart and, uh, and you filter it through your own mind so it becomes something new. So when you want to expand on your ideas or if you're sitting around and you don't really know what to do, uh, it's actually better to find something that really inspires you and just steal it. Because then it will become, become something else. Because if you just loan it, it'll, it'll just be a, a bland copy of whatever it is. Uh, 
and this sort of applies to l n not techniques, but more ideas or ideals. Like I'm very much inspired by an uh, artist called Möbius uh, and Stan Sakai. They're both comic artists. And I used to analyze their strokes and their styles, and I really wanted to make exactly the same things that they did. But after a while, it got really boring because all I could ever do was try to copy what they were doing. So instead, I tried to really, really try to like get into their minds and steal <laughs> sort of their essence and put it into my work. And that's what I did a lot with uh, Els Heartbreak. Uh, I'm gonna start with showing you the trailer. So you have a little bit of a better idea what I'm talking about. That's why I'm acting a little bit weird. <laughs> so anyway, Els Heartbreak. Uh, Els Heartbreak. <laughs> it started out with some drawings that Eric did, because he had, a, I, Eric, he's my uh, accomplice, I think it's called. He uh, uh, wanted to make a game about computers with smoke coming out of them. Like, if a computer was broken, there should be smoke coming out of it. That was really important for him. That was like the pitch that he gave me. And then he had these drawings uh, of like macapara contraptions. Um, and this was all I really had to like go with. Uh, and then I noticed like the, the beds and stuff like that and balloons almost. And he said that the game was gonna be about hacking. So there was gonna be a lot of computers in it. Uh, so I, I, thought, I thought it was funny that he was adding stuff like, you know, a little bridge. Uh, or what, whatever this thing right there is, I have no idea. Like some casino table up there or whatever. Uh, and that got me thinking that maybe he wants to build something that is about computers, but also has more sort of uh, everyday feel to it. Because uh, when you think, think computers, you tend to just think, uh, at least I do, science fiction or war games or something like that. Maybe Star Trek. So I started drawing my own characters, like just fill around with it and feel out what it, what it might be. Like how would the hackers in our game look like? And as you can see, it's all over the place. Uh, I just found the idea funny that a hacker could be like a, a farmer or something like that. 
and not just go with stereotypes. Uh, and I, I wanted to like uh, get inspiration from uh, on in, like uh, places that you didn't really think would be like the first pieces of inspiration. So I looked to uh, Gustav Klimt uh, and also a guy called Egon Schiele because I really like his hands and what he does with the eyes and the nose. Uh, and I wanted the characters to like really have a an iconic feature, uh, not to like because it was probably going to be pretty small characters, so you couldn't really like work with uh, subtle changes in the faces. So if you just make a big red nose uh, and just focus on the eyes, it's easier to vary the looks of people. Um, and they're also sort of grim and a little bit colorful. Like there's weird stuff going on in her face. I thought that was interesting. And also she has this sort of weird Gloria around her head. And the hat here too, it looks like a Gloria. Uh, I mean, this one really inspired me, like with the, with the eyes. Uh, and you're gonna notice this in the other pictures I'm gonna show you that how that really like sort of, that was a thing I stole, you could say. So this was the first like sort of character that I drew that was gonna end up in the game. It's sort of weird how I ended up starting out with the characters, but for me that's important, I think. Because since Eric wanted it to be uh, an emotional game, a, a game about computers, an emotional game about computers, uh, characters are important because we relate to them. Uh, it's pretty obvious. Uh, so I started doing weird stuff like with the makeup around the eyes, that the makeup was almost sort of like the computer aspect of the people, like the sci-fi aspect almost, like they had some sort of weird uh, programmed makeup under their eyes or something. Just a little hint. Uh, and also Scandinavian you know, moods, characters who aren't just happy, but like more real like people. Like in Scandinavia, we have also uh, grim emotions and I wanted to show that too. Uh, another character, like try to, this was sort of like when I realized that I wanted it to be a uh, three dimensional because I really like the knees, how they were like sharp. And I realized that this is not gonna be 2D, this is gonna be 3D. And why the fuck is it gonna be 3D? Because I can build 3D, I suck at it. But I guess the, uh, the, the challenge was enough because I wanted to expand. Uh, and this was the main character of the game. Uh, it was the first drawing I did of the main character and Eric was like, sure, let's do it. So this ended up being the main character and he still sort of looks like this today. Uh, we altered the coat because the game is set in Dorisburg and it's summer. And if he walks around in like a thick coat, he'll look like a retard or, sorry, an idiot. But then again, he is a little bit weird. Uh, some variations of Sebastian. Uh, as you can see, the, like, they're pretty different in their feel. And this was more what we wanted to go forward with instead of this. Because he looked too... Uh, uh, I think Eric said a little bit too wimpy. And here he looked too much like a model. Uh, and here you can see the nose, inspirations for the nose again. Uh, and also like, you can probably recognize that this is. Uh, and this was the first drawing I did of the, uh, the environment. Uh, like there are two people. There's one guy here and one guy here and he's hacking something. Uh, and he's like sort of on the lookout because Eric said he wanted it to feel, be a little bit like uh, old school hacking mo movies, like, you know, Hackers with Angelina Jolie, I don't know if you've seen it, 
but it's always like underground and they're, you know, they're almost like secret agents. And then there's this big corporation who are really evil. Uh, so I did some more pictures of that theme. And also, we were talking about the ghost and the machine, like because Eric had this, uh, like he, I don't know if you know what code rotting is, but like if you leave code alone for like months and you come back and it doesn't work anymore, but it worked the last time you used it, I don't know if anyone has like experienced this, but that's really weird, almost like there's a ghost in the machine. So I added that element too. And also, uh, I uh, did some oil paintings because I didn't want to right away get into building. I wanted to really get a feel of uh, the atmosphere and mm, the, the emotional impact that the world was going to have on the player and to just do some sketches in like Photoshop wouldn't really attach me to it. But if I spent like two weeks on an oil painting, which is maybe insane, but that would really allow me to meditate and think on what the world was gonna be like. So I did some of those. Uh, and the Gloria again, like how she's hacking, she's using a device there hacking something in the environment. And this was pretty crucial that we realized that the game is not gonna be just about hacking computers, it's gonna be about hacking your environment. You're gonna be able to alter your environment sort of like uh, inverted matrix. And this was gonna f almost be a little bit sacrilegious. That's why she has the Gloria. Uh, that signifies that she's sort of hooked into uh, the world of bits and uh, it sort of almost puts her in a, um, what would you call it? a med meditative state of mind, sort of what happens to really religious people when, you know, you've seen like some preacher, oh, hell Jesus, and then go, oh. So that idea came from there. Uh, and there you see the Gloria inside the game. Like he's hacking something over there and he has the Gloria around his head, which was also a really good, like, cool pointer to show that this person is hacking right now. Uh, you can see right away that, oh, okay, I shouldn't disturb this person or whatever. And also some other emotional paintings, like uh, that there could be like love inside the game. Eric wanted to have some love in there, which I thought was really sweet. Uh, and also cool hipsters. DJs, stuff like that, because uh, we grow up. We we wanted to base the game uh, off uh, Gothenburg, our hometown, and there are a lot of hipsters in Gothenburg. Uh, so we uh, wanted those in there too. Uh, and this character actually ended up in the game, looking exactly like this. And. Uh, That's sort of like the pre-work of everything. Uh, and then I had to get into like, how do you actually build the world? It's gonna be 3D, uh, what, are, what are my inspirations gonna be, like practically? So I, I look to old PlayStation games, because everyone was sort of like doing 2D retro at the time, and I wanted to do 3D retro, because as I said before, I don't know how to build 3D, and 3D retro, is sort of easy because it's very arbitrary shapes and all the textures are very low fi So I look to games like uh, Vagrant Story with the, uh, with also with the perspective. Like this was the perspective that I really wanted in, in the game because we were gonna build a city and Vagrant Story takes place in a city called uh, Liamonde or something I think. And I really liked how the camera operated around the character inside the city, how you rotate it, and how the streets look in the perspective. And also how the, uh, the textures look. I think it's pretty nice how they're sort of very heavily lo-fi, but they still look sort of nice because they're crisp. 
So I wanted all the textures to be crisp. And here too, like it almost looks like a dollhouse. Like everything's like these boxy shapes. And I really like what happens here with the textures. It almost looks like like how you paint, uh, how you would paint something with oil or whatever. So that looked really nice. Uh, and <laughs> this was <laughs> the first. Uh, prototype that we did, and as you can see, it's totally not what I've just shown you. It looks sort of like, uh, it's really smudgy, uh, and we didn't really like it at all. But this is where we found out that since you're supposed to be able to rotate the room, what's going to happen with the walls? This is where we found out that the walls are actually going to disappear when the camera looks through them, which was very crucial. And Eric had to spend like a month just building the system for that. Uh, and here's like the next stage of what the, the graphics would look like. It's still pretty ugly. So I uh, had to use some more inspiration because uh, I felt like I couldn't really get it right. So I looked at Final Fantasy Tactics and also, uh, um, what the hell is it? Breath of Fire. Because uh, they had really nice colors. I really liked how it was sort of gray, and then it had dots of colors everywhere. And especially how this is designed, for some reason, really inspired me. Uh, how there were like little shapes everywhere in the textures, and I realized that I could actually create the shapes inside the textures without having to build the shapes in 3D. Uh, and so I decided to copy this image, do something like this, and then try to build this straight up in 3D. And it started out like this, and then the next step. And this was sort of like too uh, saturated. So we toned it down a little bit and added some lighting. And then we felt like, okay, this is the r direction we're gonna take with the graphics of the game, because now everything looks pretty nice. Uh, and as you can see, there are like all the little shapes going on here, also in the computer and on the door. Like you get a lot of information out of this image, but all the shapes are like just boxes. Since I can't build anything in 3D, you just grab the box tool and you know scale it. And then you can still do pretty uh, advanced stuff with it. And I needed some more inspiration. Uh, so I looked to a Swedish uh, sort of doll show called Skrotnisse, which is really depressing and weird, and it's for kids. Uh, but they had all these little nooks and crannies everywhere, like all like weird stuff everywhere, like a lot of information, a lot of uh, details everywhere. And like the, the city is almost like worn down a little bit. And I wanted that too, because if you want if you're gonna create interesting textures for really large surfaces and try to make them interesting, it's very easy if you just make them a little bit dirty. Not like brown, rusty, but some cracks here and there, and so that it actually looks alive and worn out because that's really important if you want the place to feel alive, uh, that people are actually living there, uh, they're using the place, and the place is gonna burn down eventually. And also here, like this big pipe right here was like also a major inspiration. Like we have pipes everywhere inside the game because it's very easy also to, if you, if you find that a surface or a place is really like empty, you can just put a lot of pipes in there. And here we got some more examples of like all the, the stuff. And I felt like I really wanted the same amount of stuff. Like, I don't know how to explain, but we have stuff here, we have stuff there. There's like someone's actually living here and I wanted it to be like that everywhere. And also the houses, inspiration for the houses. 
and here we go again. Like all the weird stuff going on. Like why is there a door there? Like what's, what's happening here? Like and up there also. And you see the pipes again and what's going, down, what's going on here? Like so I really wanted to build a city where you could find all these little places and nooks and crannies if you really looked for it. Like, what's going on here? Okay, what's happening behind here? And then you find a ladder, and then you end up underground, and then you come out someplace else, and you really get lost. I don't know if you've done that, but that's sort of, if, if you go like ex urban exploring in other cities, that's usually what happens. You get totally lost, but it's really interesting. So, I drew a map of the city, and as you can see, it's pretty ambitious. Uh, and I was like, oh, we're gonna build the whole city like this. And Eric and Tobias, who was gonna help me out with the graphics, they were like, no, we're not. And I almost got angry at them. Are you lazy? Come on. So we, we ended up actually building half of it. And almost all the houses sort of looked like this, and you can go inside almost all the houses in the game too. So I think we have uh, 170 rooms or something. Uh, and this is an overview from like uh, one of the rooms. There, I say rooms because that's what it's called in Unity. We used Unity to build everything uh, or to put everything together. Uh, so this is like one place that's outside and all the doors, you can go inside all the doors and stuff goes on in there. People live there. They walk about. There are computers that you can hack and stuff. And as you can see, the, I, where the inspiration comes from, like that I really, really stole all the ideas that I got from the pictures of Skrutnice and Vagrant Story and uh, Breath of Fire and mashed it up into one thing. And still, it's just arbitrary shapes, almost everything. I mean, I, of course, I realized how to cut polygons down the line. So I could make roofs like this, have diagonal shapes. And I did some more drawings, because now I sort of really knew what the style was going to be like. So then it, would, it was time to like draw, do drawings that were still really uh, detailed, not the usual concept that you do, you just get a feel of the area, like you spend like two or three hours on the picture and then you just get, you get the atmosphere there, but really actually draw stuff that was gonna be inside the game. So they were actually working like blueprints almost. So all this stuff here, is actually in the game looking almost like that. As you can see, too bad it's dark. And here we go again. This ended up being this. But as you can see on the floor, I mean, that's just a big, big shape, a big surface. But it feels really alive because of all the cracks and how it's rendered with the uh, highlights and shadows. Especially here on the edges. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in the end. More drawings. And also some more examples of what's going on, how, how the city looks, like more zoomed in and how the, all the inspiration really came to life. Uh, that I actually used everything that I wanted to use. That was really important for me. Okay, half, halfway through, cool. Uh, more environments. And also, I mean, a city is usually sort of gray and brown often. And then it was important to put a lot of color inside like flowers and weird sculptures. And also maybe some marquises or whatever what you call that in English uh, to really have clicks of color everywhere to brighten it up. And we also built a garden. 
uh, it looks harder than it is actually. Uh, it's just a lot of um, alpha textures that creates all the leaves and stuff like that. Some rain, a tram, the harbor. Okay, we got some objects too. Uh, a lot of pictures of objects, because we had to put a lot of objects in there too. So we got inspiration from like old pictures from IBM. Uh, how were the computers actually gonna look? Because they were gonna be like almost like relics, we felt, not just uh, these neon high tech stuff. It was actually gonna be like old, it was gonna feel like old relics that had sort of almost been lost, but people were still using them. So I took a lot of inspiration from all these shapes. I mean, this is really weird. I mean, wh what's going on with this computer? I mean, how, how does this shit work? I have no idea. And that's <laughs> the idea that we wanted to convey because nowadays everyone knows almost how a computer looks and how it works. But if we make computers that look really weird, people would hopefully gonna get interested. And also like, these are also computers. It's almost like furniture. And the Cray computer, which we put inside the game too. And this was also really inspired uh, the shapes of stuff, like how it's all very blocky. And this is pretty cool too. And as you can see, some of the stuff ended up in the game, like how the shapes are. This is the same computer that you saw before over here. Like a, almost like a station. So it's a supercomputer that you can actually use and hack the environment. And there we go, another computer. And here we go too, another computer. More computers. And also, it, like the just to show you the level of detail, like you can't pick any of, of this stuff up, but it's there to actually like show you that someone's actually living there again. The beer you can pick up, and the cup of coffee. And here's a uh, computer, and the Cray computer, how it looks inside the game. So how did I do the textures? Because there, there was gonna be a lot of textures in there. And I was probably gonna go mad, I realized that, so I needed to find a technique that was sort of easy to do, but still looked nice. Uh, so basically I just drew everything with black lines to find the shapes inside the textures, and then color it with different colors, and uh, to get like a, a level of detail and uh, sort of like a texture to them so that they would feel more alive. I just used a lighter hue and a darker hue of the color in the section. And since it's all inside black lines, you can just use the magic wand tool. Uh, so it's easy to like shift around the colors very fast. You don't have to repaint anything uh, and, and then just do some highlights and some shades uh, on, the, on all the edges. It doesn't make sense. It's not truthfully, like, it's not how things would look in the real world, but it actually feels real and it actually works. Uh, so you get an, a really nice, uh, what do you call it? A really nice... Uh, I'm from Sweden. Uh, result fairly easy, quickly. 
And this was something I actually learned from uh, painting in oil, because uh, that's how it works. It almost works the same. If you find all like the edges of the small shapes everywhere, and you do the same thing there, things actually start to come alive. It's the same thing happening here. And also here, you can see it here on the box and on, on his little knee here, how it's very light. And then you have some darkness here and like the, the edges, like really pick up the edges of things. Uh, same here. Sometimes I needed to use, I actually sheeted. So I used some uh, photos. I went out and took some photos of like, I don't know, uh, rock or something and just put it in there. Very, very uh, subtle and then filled out some of the cracks with the same technique. And fairly quickly you get like a really good result on a, on a, like a totally bland surface. Same thing here. You can actually go a little wild with it and use like, uh, I don't know what you call it, differential colors, I think. Like you see it's blue. And then for the highlight, you use some yellow instead. And then you get the, uh, a pretty result. And also use gradients. That was something I learned from painting with watercolors. Because the, the watercolors are really like, um, they don't cover so well, so you can paint in layers and get different various results. So I felt like, wow, I, I can do that in Photoshop. I'll just do a gradient and work some opacity and then use the blend tools. And then you go from this to this. And it, I mean, it's not much, but in the larger scale, it really, really alters the appearance of things. Uh, so yeah, here you can see like, how the <laughs> gradients work there and also on the here and on that scarf. So that was sort of like a aha moment. Just to show you that by using various techniques that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the computer, uh, you can actually get like new ideas to use inside the computer because the computer is a fantastic tool. It can do anything. So you just need to expand your thoughts and your minds to find new ways of doing things. Also here, what happens here, there, and also here. I mean, maybe because the picture is complete, it doesn't do much, but if you would have seen it without all of these things, also on the neck, it would be like a totally different picture. It was just a easy way to make it pop. Some more examples of how gradients were used. And also here, there's like very, very little just here. This is, a, I don't know what it is. It's some piece of a fountain, I think. And if I, if I wouldn't have used this, this is like the, the thing, the ground level of the piece. Uh, this is a texture for a model. So without this, the uh, edge between the piece and the ground would be very much more uh, uh, severe. But with this little, little tiny piece of gradient, and I think it's, uh, it's some kind of blend, really like smooth it out so it feels more real. Uh, and I think that's it if it made any sense to any of you. So are there any questions? Or was everything crystal clear? There's one? Oh, yes. Oh yeah, I could just, okay. Yeah, I could do that, why not? Hello. Hello. Uh, what did you do to stay motivated for five years? I probably shouldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, but th there were periods of uh, wine and weed. Uh, 
but that's uh, yeah okay <laughs> but that's just because it's easy to like sort of just do it because time just passes and you just do it because it's insane to build something like this uh, you really have to want it and you really have to sacrifice your body uh, I'm not fat yet but I'm, I, I guess I'm getting there so uh, yeah, more questions over here. Okay. Sorry to do this. No, it's cool. I don't mind. I need the workout. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Um, I want to say that it looks uh, spectacular first, and um, my question is regarding time. In 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 your head, uh, how much time did it take you to flesh out um, this art style, like really knowing what you're building? Uh, a year, maybe. I, the first two months, I did all the paintings and stuff, uh, and then I knew what I wanted to do, and I had an idea for how the style was gonna be, but then it took like another year, maybe, to get it right. So I, <laughs> I had to go back and redo all the stuff that I did in the beginning. Yay, but that's actually kind of fun also, I guess. My, I had problems with my girlfriend too at the time, so it was sort of easy to just sit down and do it and not think about love life. How do you make sure that uh, you keep a certain consistency throughout your development through five years? I mean, you start making, at least when I start making like artwork for a game, then the artwork in the end almost looks like an entirely different game from the artwork I start with. Well, um, what, I guess luck has to do with it to some extent, but also really uh, I put a lot of uh, time into actually uh, trying to get an idea of a world that I loved, that I really cared about, uh, and, and get like a clear picture in your head of what it was going to be, how it was going to feel, not just looks, but how it was going to feel, the atmosphere. And the atmosphere is more important than the level of expertise, I think. So there are actually some, some stuff that I didn't like redo because the atmosphere was still there. So it wouldn't, people wouldn't notice it. Maybe if you, you know, use a magnifying glass and really get into it. Uh, so I, just having a clear, really clear picture of what you want to do, love it and stay true to it. And it's a commitment because sometimes you want to just <laughs> do something else. But you, it's sort of like a relationship. You, you work on it and you, you uh, compromise. There was over there. I have two questions actually. Uh, the first one is like your hair and your beard the result of the five years. That, that you had very short hair when you started and then... <laughs> actually, I, yeah, I actually we, sort of shaved before we did we started <laughs> and didn't shave afterwards. Ah, okay. Uh, no, my, my real question is uh, like they say an artwork is an artwork is never finished; it's abandoned. Uh, like, were you happy at the point it's now? I I, I don't want to be rude, but I actually think that uh, an artwork is finished. Like to me, that's sort of a little bit bullshit. Because it depends on what you want to do. I mean, some people just want to expand on a certain piece. I would rather complete it in my mind and then complete it in actual reality and then move on. If that answers your question. Is, is that it? No more questions? Okay. So um, your in your character designs, your fashion, like where do you, where do you get your inspiration for the fashion of the characters? Kind of like this gypsy future thing going on. Uh, Merbius, yeah, you should look him up. Uh, and also the hipsters in Gothenburg, I guess. <laughs> Just mix the two. Okay. We have ten more minutes. Whoa. Yeah, I have some more. This is the... Oh.
so it looks really amazing. I was just wondering, since this is um, kind of your first time working with 3D as well, yeah. like after five years um, for future projects, would you say you'd tackle it again after this experience? Or would you say you're going back to 2D and see how it goes? I will never work in 3D again. <laughs> No, unless, you know, in 10 years, who knows? Uh, yeah, I need a huge break right now. Because as I said before, like with the Immortal Swordsman, I, I feel like my technique has gotten sloppy. Uh, so I need to hone my swords, uh, I guess. To just paint like uh, with the oil and watercolor and like sort of regain the <laughs> mindfulness of it, or whatever you want to call it. I don't know. There's one in the back. Hello. Uh, I really enjoy the the overview of the city and the houses, and I was curious if you have a wireframe of. Uh, one of the environments. Not with me, I don't. But the wireframe is probably very uh, 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 low, I think you would call it, uh, since it's mostly just boxes that are scaled. Uh, but I don't know if. We could hook up afterwards, and you, I could send you some if you want. Okay. And another one. Maybe you already said this, but what, which program did you use? To build? Uh, Unity, and I started out, I used different, like some Blender and some Autodesk. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, basically those two. Uh, that was it. And Photoshop, of course, and Photoshop. Uh, uh, yeah, I, th this is boring stuff, <laughs> so I'm not gonna show this. It just has to do with the texture smudge. So uh, you work with Unity, um, and Unity wants you to do things in a certain way. So for the final look at the game, did you have any conflicts with Unity where you had to do some other work with shaders or whatever to well, get the look the way you want? Uh, since it's so easy like to build like this, it's just textures and uh, 3D models, it, it wasn't a problem. And the lighting in Unity is really good. Like it has really good like real-time lighting. So that was basically it. And you can we just put like one... Uh, shader on top of everything to give everything a little bit extra dodgy color and that's easy too. We didn't use any advanced shaders or anything. I think Eric wanted to, but I said no. <laughs> so, uh, another one. I, I noticed that you wanted to have like a really crisp look, but I noticed in f some of your screenshots that the textures still were sort of smudgy. Have you come over this issue? Uh, yeah, some of it. Because I wanted it to be super crisp. Like, I wanted it to be, uh, I think, a point sampled. Uh, and everything is like bilinear sampled by default and it makes it look super smudgy. And Eric felt like having it uh, point sampled would create these weird little. Uh, uh, anti anti alias edges and would sort of hurt your eyes if you sit with it too long. So uh, we skipped that and instead uh, made an importer that sort of blew up the textures uh, in, in double size. So the smudge became less, which is very really not good from an optimization point of perspective. No, and some of the textures that are really large are became didn't really we're still smudgy. So we're still, I guess we're still working on that. I don't know, I think so. Maybe we just double it another time. Yeah. 
Yeah. 20,000 by 20,000 per second. I guess we're in that state right now, the technical stuff. Get some help for people who... Yeah, who knows this stuff. Yeah, exactly. Get some help. Help is good. Okay. So when you've got different sized objects, were you trying to match the pixel resolution between them? Uh, that's actually kind of interesting because at first I did. I wanted to uh, all the pixels to be the same size and I put an insane amount of time into doing that and it, it actually made me lose my mind. So I realized that this is not going to hold up. Uh, so I just tried to go with a, a gut feeling. And in the end, it actually ended up looking better because it, it gave a, sort of like a, a human feeling to it. Like all, almost when you build a dollhouse by hand, uh, you paint every object differently. So they sort of, there's a little bit of like uh, discrepance between them. And it, it just creates a, a more human touch to it. So it wasn't really a problem after all. Yes? Can I also ask? Yes. Um, now, I was just curious, uh, how is it going with the uh, secret arcade within the game? Like, uh, like how many, if you maybe can explain briefly what it is and how many games you had. And are applications still open for, can people still submit games oh, for yeah. the secret arcade? Yeah, we have a secret arcade inside the game because the game is about uh, hacking and you can hack almost everything inside the game. So we have uh, arcade machines inside the game that you can hack and create your own games. And I guess we have six or eight or something. Uh, and it's called the Secret Arcade. So if anyone wants to make a game within the game in our coding language called Språk, uh, you can come to me afterwards and I can uh, uh, email you. Because I don't know the link in my head. Eric does. OK. More questions? Oh, no, okay. Uh, two more questions then. Um, uh, because this um, uh, way of working was so out of your comfort zone from the normal things you do, how did it, um, how did you go through with it on an emotional level? Because for such a different uh, platform of working on it. Uh, I guess all emotions, basically. Like, but I was also very uh, inspired by it because I believe in going outside your comfort zones. So it, it was the first three years, it was exciting, and the last two years, no, the last year it was sort of uh, mind crushing, and the last year it was just get done, I guess. Yeah, but that's, that's just because it took so long. And you can't really ditch it halfway through. Um, yeah, since you mentioned that you didn't like doing 3D, why didn't you find someone else who would join you in doing it 3D for you? So you could focus on 2D. Uh, I tried that before, and I ended up screaming at the person. So it wouldn't be good for anyone. And as I said before, uh, I actually, I, there's some, you sort of get an enjoyment out of tackling something that you don't like. And you sort of, the Stockholm Syndrome maybe, you end up liking it eventually. And yeah, you get some good experiences from it also. So I'm lying a little bit when I'm saying that I hate it. I just disliked it to begin with. And now I'm sort of OK with it. OK, that's it. Thank you.